in the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Who is this bespeckled man warning us about the dangers of America's growing military industrial complex? Is he some beatnik activist, some cautious academic, maybe some burnt out soldier who has seen a little too much of war? The last description probably fits this man best. It's Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe. He was responsible for planning the D-Day invasion on Normandy and the opening of the Western Front during World War II. Eisenhower would also become the 34th President of the United States. He would stay in office for two terms. That speech about the impending dangers of the rising strength of the military-industrial complex was actually his farewell speech. So what exactly is the military-industrial complex and why would Eisenhower spend his last moments in office talking about it? By definition, the military-industrial complex is an informal alliance between a nation's military and the defense industry that supplies it. In a republic, this can be troubling because the military is usually designed to serve the people, or at least the government, and not have any type of favoritism towards or influence from specific private companies or industries. Such close connections between the military and private contractors have created all sorts of unscrupulous behavior and corruption. The establishment of the clone army was nothing if secretive and done completely outside of the regulatory bodies and civilian journalists that watched the government. This is a clear example of a military industrial contractor basically skipping over the proper channels for acquiring a government contract and perhaps doing some very illegal things in order to get that very lucrative clone trooper contract. It's actually one of the least believable parts of the Clone Wars in my opinion. Why would a government be willing to accept a secret army that has no idea where it came from? Of course, Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious did have a lot of things going for them at the beginning of the Clone Wars. One, the Confederacy of Independent Systems had just declared independence along with revealing their own massive droid army. The Republic had also been demilitarized for more than a thousand years, so there was no culture of uh, the volunteer citizen soldier, and there definitely wasn't enough political capital to go around to actually start a mandatory draft. So the appearance of the clone army was a godsend for the Republic. It was also great for the Kaminoan cloners and any contractor that worked to create and supply the clone army. The Supreme Chancellor Palpatine was also given emergency power so that he could instate the army as the official Republic military force. The EPA, or Emergency Powers Act, was actually an amendment to the Galactic Constitution that essentially granted the Supreme Chancellor the ability to make instant decisions without the need for full Senate approval. It was argued that the severe gridlock in the Senate would prevent the Republic from being able to handle the upcoming trials in this massive war. The EPA also got rid of term limits for the Chancellor position. Now, Palpatine was a brilliant man and politician. He had slyly planted the ideas of the EPA within the minds of the Sith Lord Jar Jar Binks, representative from Naboo. Palpatine understood that the EPA would be a very controversial act and that it would be less controversial and suspicious if it came at least from someone else's lips and not his own. And luckily for Palpatine, he also had many other allies in the Senate that he had won through either political means or other more unorthodox methods. So how did Palpatine get to where he was? How did he actually go from being a junior senator from Naboo to the Supreme Chancellor so quickly? Well, it all starts with a small organization known as Damas Holdings, a lobbying group that was actually started by Palpatine's master, Darth Plagueis. Lobbying groups within a republic are some of the most powerful agents at work in the system. With massive amounts of capital, a properly run lobbying group can position the right politicians in the right places to create huge societal change. Over time, Damask Holdings was able to secure several positions in the Senate that would essentially become lifelong appointments and allies for Palpatine's cause. Damask Holdings also had several connections with Outer Rim Corporations. 
Companies like the Intergalactic Banking Clan, Trade Federation, and Techno Union, who all were spending massive amounts of capital in order to expand into the unregulated free trade zone. The free trade zone was initially established to encourage investment into a part of the galaxy that sorely needed updates to its infrastructure. When that actually happened and the free trade zone became very prosperous, Finis Valorum then overturned the free trade zone and started taxing all corporate interests operating inside of the free trade zone. Damask Holdings pushed these companies into open rebellion and later on war. What's more, Damask Holdings was able to convince the Senate to allow certain corporate entities to even be represented in the Senate as if they were a nation or a planet. And so when Palpatine was granted the EPA, it was several corporate interests, or at least corporate-backed senators, who also supported his rise to power. These same corporate entities would supply weapons and munitions for the Separatist Alliance and at the same time actively be involved in the political processes of the Republic. And if that's not treason, I don't know what is. Now, prior to World War II, America's own military industrial complex was quite limited in scope. Prior to World War II, around 1% of the annual GDP went to arms production. Whereas in the midst of World War II, that number jumped up to 40%. Which makes sense because we were fighting Nazis and Samurais and zombies, maybe all three depending on which map you're playing. It was really an intense period in American history. Marvel even did a few movies about it. Now the problem was once the fighting stopped and V-Day came around. Several American companies that had retooled themselves for the war continued expanding and maintaining their defense divisions. Subsequently, the world started realigning itself for the next global war. In Star Wars, we see a similar thing happen. Due to the Rusan Reformation prior to the Clone Wars, most of the large ship manufacturers and our manufacturers in the galaxy mostly supplied regional and planetary defense forces along with private security. There was a market for weapons and munitions and ships, but it's mostly a defensive market. For instance, the ships of this era were more likely to feature heavy shielding and tractor beams rather than massive banks of turbo lasers like we'll see during the Imperial era. Now, one of the more difficult parts of creating a secret army like the Clone Army is finding actual suppliers, vendors, and contractors to equip that army for combat. Darth Vegas, who had access to essentially the entire galaxy through Damask Holdings, was free to transfer money to any organization or cause that he wanted. At the time, Quad Drive Yards was one of the largest shipbuilders in the entire galaxy. Needless to say, thousands of years of peace had forced the orbital shipyard to scale back the size of its operation. The Rusan Reformation not only ended the federal military's demand for new capital ships, it also imposed severe restrictions on what type of capital ships could be built, down to how many turbo lasers could be placed on, let's say, a dreadnought. Things were very limited and society was moving towards gradual demilitarization. To make matters worse, KDY was competing with several other defense contractors over a shrinking list of planetary defense force contracts that were barely keeping their shipyards operational. Rendelli Star Drive had established itself as a premier designer of smaller cruiser-type ships that were in high demand for smaller defense forces. KDY was also in contention for this market, and by increasing the size and power of their ships, they were eventually able to make Rendelli Star Drive ships and more importantly, they were also able to put their massive shipyard into full operation again for the first time in hundreds of years. Capitalism is our greatest achievement in driving force, but it can also potentially be our road to ruin. Blindly embracing any ideology is a dangerous thing, especially when you let that ideology start making decisions for you instead of allowing yourself to approach each situation with careful judgment. In our own world, businesses like KDY have been involved in our government's operation at the highest levels, just like Dwight D. Eisenhower warned us. When former Halliburton CEO Dick Cheney became VP during one of the most devastating terrorist attacks on American soil, it could be argued that he steered the president and Congress towards war. Within a few years, Halliburton was slowly moving up the food chain as the world's second biggest oil field services company and the sixth largest U.S. military contractor company. Sure, they were just building shelters and providing food for U.S. soldiers, a pretty innocent thing to do, until you find out that they overcharged the government more than a billion dollars within just a few years of operation. Or at least that's what the official audits say. And so by 2006, Halliburton stopped being the exclusive military contractor for Army logistical support. Of course, this is nothing new. We've all heard of the $10,000 toilet seats used by the Air Force and the government officials that give out contractors to friends in the private industry. 
So now back to Quad Drive Yards, who is in the process of expanding the size of their capital ships. They would first test out these super dreadnoughts and star destroyers on their own sector defense fleets. But you wonder BB why Quad Drive Yards had the most powerful fleet in the entire galaxy. Their first battle cruiser, the Procurator class, was 2,500 meters long, making Rendelli's own 600 meter dreadnought class heavy cruiser seem like a picket ship in comparison. Did the galaxy really need a 2,500 meter long battle cruiser? Well, probably not before Quad Drive Yards created one, which then also created the market for a 3,000 meter battle cruiser. At this point, it's just basically a bunch of chimps comparing dick sizes. And the beginning of a very lovely and terrifying arms race. Except it's not driven by competing ideologies or different alien races, it's driven by competing corporations. Quad Drive Yards was the obvious partner in Crime for Dark Plagueis. They clearly stood the game from a galaxy-wide war, and although they might not have known the full extent of the mutants' plan, they understood that there was a massive army the likes of which the galaxy had not seen in hundreds of years. A massive army that would need transport, ships, tanks, blasters, food, shelter. A massive army that also needed to be created away from the prying eyes of government and journalists. Luckily, the type of people who ran KDY were used to having unscrupulous clients. You see, around 800 BBY, KDY bought the mineral-rich planet Rothana out in wild space. On this planet, they established a new subsidiary company known as Rothana Heavy Engineering. Its operation was kept remote and completely secret, which was easy to do because Rothana was at the end of uh, several very convoluted hyperspace lane jumps, and only people who knew how to get there could really get there. It was in order to prevent uh, corporate espionage. It also happens to be the perfect place to produce all the war equipment needed for the clone army. Rothana Heavy Engineering would go on to produce everything from ATTE walkers to LAAT landers and even the Acclimator class assault ship. As a matter of fact, during the Battle of Geonosis, everything the clone army fielded came from Rothana Heavy Engineering. The Venator class Star Destroyer, for instance, was being developed by KDY and couldn't really start active production until the war started. KDY had one very important goal, and it wasn't to help Palpatine or the Republic, it was to destroy their main competitor, Rendelli Star Drives. Like any corporate entity, achieving an acceptable monopoly was key. By acceptable, I mean avoiding whatever antitrust laws are created by the government to prevent it from becoming a monopoly in the first place. It should be noted that I could not find any direct references to antitrust laws in the long list of legislation proposed by the Republic Senate, although I did find an anti-Sith bill which came off as a bit regressive and an impediment of the freedom of religion offered by the Galactic Republic Constitution. Antitrust laws in theory are supposed to prevent monopolies occurring like Airbus and Boeing's 99% control of the airplane markets, or the six large media conglomerates that control 90% of our media and news here in America. Of course, in a thriving free market, a private company is far more innovative, flexible, and has a lot more funding than the regulatory bodies that are struggling to try to contain it. As a matter of fact, in America, many industries are allowed to self-regulate. And so when Boeing and Airbus bought out the two last independent aircraft manufacturers, Embraer and Bombardier, and completed their infinity gauntlet of aircraft industry control, the U.S. government cheered on Boeing. And so when Boeing decided not to overhaul their 50-year-old Boeing 737 model and try to stretch its design for a new generation of engines with the Boeing 737 MAX, the U.S. government and also the shareholders cheered Boeing on. The Boeing 737 MAX cost about 10% as much as designing a whole new plane. And at the same time, a computer program was installed to make the flight characteristics of this new unstable platform similar to previous 737 products, which meant that airlines didn't have to send their pilots to costly training programs. Which is a really big deal because as we found out recently, airplane companies have extremely small and ridiculous profit margins. Boeing also further saved money by putting the squeeze on its many vendors and supply chains, leading to more quality issues and complaints from airlines when the aircraft are delivered. In healthy free market society, a company like Boeing probably deserves to collapse, but because Boeing has no competition, it's not just a company in America, it becomes also an essential part of our infrastructure. Without Boeing, Airbus can hardly meet the demands of the world's airline industry. Boeing also has many contracts with our military, our government, and NASA, and is considered a strategic resource and asset. Even the president flies around in a heavily modified Boeing 747. Boeing has essentially reached that sweet spot in the corporate ladder that allows it to be too big and too important to fail.
We see the same thing happen to the Empire as it transitions from the Republic. Even without any true strategic threat, KDY continues producing larger and larger ships. The Venator is replaced by the Imperial-class Star Destroyer. The ATTE, for some reason, is stretched out into the ATAT. The Death Star, the Star Dreadnought, are all signs of a military-industrial complex that completely has grown out of control. And worst of all, small companies like Incom were still able to create a superior product like the X-Wing, which ultimately rendered everything here I'm talking about obsolete. A massive military-industrial complex which is focused on only sustaining its own growth begins neglecting its products. Instead of focusing on performance and design, the Empire focused on spending as much money as possible for its permanent wartime economy. War, of course, can create innovation and also new technologies. I'm not denying that. I mean, the very phone or screen you're holding and the internet through which I am traveling through to get to you was most likely invented in the pursuit of killing people. It's an undeniable truth, but not necessarily the only path we could have taken to get to where we are today. Innovation for the sake of innovation happens every day, especially when we allow it to. And in the few moments where war is justified and we send our brave young men and women to their deaths, let us make sure at least we are sending them to defend the weak and guard our nation's ideas and virtues rather to further the business interests of our military industrial complex. What's great about science fiction is that it is humanity's attempt to try to figure out its own future. It's a very prophetic genre, and therefore my favorite genre. Now, it doesn't obviously have all of the answers, but the key thing here is it gets us thinking about important issues. Issues like the military-industrial complex. Now, I know in this video I've said a lot of negative things about this particular part of our society, and I haven't said any of the pros, but that's really up to you guys to find out, because my intention here is not only to talk about Star Wars lore, but also introduce to you guys important things that are happening in the real world that are going to affect you one day or probably are affecting you right now. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.